Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it. Che tu ci dica la potenza del Santo Rosario contro di te. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, we'd like to start by saying thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos and your continuous support of our videos really do mean a lot. As this channel has recently hit the 20,000 subscribers, we felt we come up with a mega compilation of worthy highlights shared by exorcists that we think will be useful to you. So this video is by far the longest we've made, and we hope that by the end of the video you'll learn a lot that can be helpful in your own spiritual warfare. Now buckle up and let's get right on it then. So the first thing we should start with is why we shouldn't be afraid of the devil. You know, demons are nothing to fear. You know, the devil always wants to present himself as something more than he is. And I think that's probably why I'm more public in talking about uh, what the Catholic Church believes about exorcisms, because I want to debunk a lot of the myths. You know, the devil would prefer actually to work in the shadows, because when you drag him out into the light, you really come to realize that uh, his bark is worse than his bite, shall we say. So the more that we understand about him, the, know, the more that we come to know that he's nothing to fear. As Father Lampert puts it, if we're living out our faith, if one is going to church and praying and reading the Bible, then the devil is already on the run. So people that are truly living out their faith, they really have nothing to fear from the evil one. The evil one may try to afflict them to some degree to see if he can find a crack in their spiritual armor. But again, if one is truly committed to the Lord, no matter what the devil does, he will be ineffective. Did you know that during one interview, Father Lampert shared that one of the most popular questions that people googled on the internet is how to make a pact with the devil? Because somehow the devil is now seen as this kind of charismatic figure who can give us what we want. But we always have to realize that when you play with the devil, Eventually, the devil expects to be paid. And how does he want to be paid? It's with our death and destruction. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to give us life and so that we might have it more abundantly. But the devil wants nothing more than to snuff out the life of the human person. And again, he can present his deceptions as something good. And even when people turn to the devil, you know, try to sell their soul to the devil, initially, maybe they receive a favorable response. But that's nothing more than a trick to try to lure them even uh, deeper into the world of the lies and deception. I watched an interview of Father Chad Ripperger recently, and there's something he said that's quite interesting. In his own words, Father Ripperger said that the demons are boring because it's the same stuff over and over again. It's the stuff that you hear about the saints or about God or about Our Lady. For example, one case I had, Joan of Arc was the nemesis. He hated, he was the nemesis of Joan of Arc under a very specific um, title. And the, um, the, what was interesting is, is that one of the things you found out is, is that he, he caused a very specific kind of a suffering in her, um, but as a result of that, she became his nemesis as a result of it. So it was because of her combating him and not succumbing to it that she ended up becoming the nemesis in this very specific aspect of his of him as a demon. So what happens is, is um, at a certain point, they asked Joan of Arc, what are you afraid of? Because she didn't seem to be afraid. She was very valiant. She would go into battle and things of this sort, and she said treason. As it turns out, um, the, wow. his, she is the nemesis of Satan under the aspect of Satan being the inciter of treason through ambition. You think about that in our modern historic context, that's pretty big, right? And the reason she became the nemesis of him for that reason is because the archbishop who put her to death was actually doing it. He was persecuting her and put her to death because he wanted to get a higher bishopric. There's something that Father Carlos Martin shared during an interview that I liked very much, and it's this. Either you're with God or you're with the devil. There's no in-between. If the devil is your master, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in him or not, then he has rights over you. And if you give him even more rights through your moral living, your poor choices and so forth, then he has just by virtue of being your master, he always has the rights to possess. If he is your master, always has the right, but he gains more of them. He gains more of a jurisdiction in your soul. That's why a possession can happen all at once through one simple action 
And it's a function of, like I said, the state of the soul of the individual, but also too, the level of, of authority and power inherent within that particular demon. Demons, they, they vary in rank and power and in authority themselves. The higher the demon, the more authority he brings, the more power he possesses. And here's something you might find interesting as well. According to Father Martins, the sacrament of confession is a horrifically neglected sacrament. It is God's greatest gift that people need today. They need to just get rid of their sins because one confession is worth more than a thousand exorcisms. And to be very clear, exorcists conduct exorcisms on people only to free them enough to get them to confession. In, in John chapter 20, when Christ makes his resurrection appearance to his apostles, his first priests on the beach, he breathed on them and he said, peace be with you. If you forgive men's sins, they are forgiven. You do not forgive them. They are not forgiven. So you can confess your sins to God all you want. They are not taken away. He has, you, you don't have a right to tell God the manner he would choose to forgive your sins. You don't have that right. You, you, you receive your marching orders as a servant and you follow them. You obey them. That, that's how that works. For those of us who aren't quite used to seeing demons, seeing people levitating, or what we usually see in the movies, which for the most part, a lot of them got it pretty accurate, not all, but mostly. So again, for those of us who aren't quite used to seeing that, I'm not sure about you, but I'll definitely won't stick around to see any longer than I have to. But for exorcists like Father Martin's, it's getting to a point where the devil even stopped trying to scare him with his parlor tricks. Interesting, isn't it, how the devil stops when he sees that his scare tactic doesn't work anymore? Well, why don't we hear from Martin's himself about this? Look, if you walked into a room and you experienced a chair levitating in front of you and then flipping through the air and sailing past your face and just maybe within an inch of your nose. Um, that, that maybe will get your blood pressure up a little bit, maybe make the hair on the back of your neck stand. Okay. So by the 89th time, is it going to have the same effect? What, what about the 289th time? You're not going to even put down your cup of coffee when you see it. It loses its effect. So this is the reality that even the devil has to confront. And at a certain point, we recognize that these manifestations are parlor tricks. Parlor tricks. And according to Father Martins, there were also a few times during exorcisms when the demons manifested to someone with the face of animal, a serpent, a pig, a wolf cow. And, you know, I was just, I, I was less than a foot away from his face, so I could see it clear as day. And, and then all of a sudden I look and, and those fangs are gone. They're not there. So the devil, the, these are illusions. These are meant to scare you. Once you are aware of that, then they lose their power. Besides the scare tactic that the demons usually employ during exorcisms, according to Father Martins, they would also try another strategy, which is trying to get the exorcist to sympathize with them. But it's rather telling that Father Martins said that the demons are world-class actors and they're not really saying any of that out of remorse, or what some who think that somehow the demons will repent at one point in the future, they won't. You feel incredible sympathy for the devil. He starts telling you, you have no idea what it's like to be me. If I don't do this, the devil beats me up. Right? It's a constant agony. The smell is horrific. If I... And so, you know what, and I've, I've been here, I've been here many times, most exorcists, if they've, if they've been an exorcist for, you know, for any length of time, they're going to encounter this tactic where there's a sympathy for the devil that is strategized on his part. And so, you know, the, always the check for this immediately to get out of this is you tell the devil, okay you know what, if, if life is really bad and you regret your decision, because they'll tell you that, right? See, the decision of the devil, of, of any demon to rebel against God is an eternal decision. It's, it's an ever now decision. And the proof is in the pudding. I say, okay, well then turn to Jesus right now. Turn to Jesus and say, just say to him, hey, forgive me. I accept you as, as my Lord and God. He will accept you. And his, he'll, he'll immediately say, F you, priest. And, and there you have it. It's an Oscar-winning performance. 
Now for the next clip. I've shared in the past where exorcists are saying this as well, but I guess it's worth mentioning again. So to be very clear, demons cannot read your mind in the sense that they don't have access to your intellect such that they can perceive your thoughts. They can guess. They are astoundingly astute. They look at you. They've studied your whole life. They know what your likes are. They know what tempts you. They can also read your physiological response. They can see what your heart rate is doing. They can see where you're sweating. This is child's play for the demons. But in our inner core, what is going through our mind, what is not visible externally, the demons cannot access. Now, what they can do is at the lower levels of your mind, your lower levels, so at the level of the imagination, they can implant something in there, right? They do that at temptation. They do that with an aberrant thought. So the lowest level, the lowest level of your mind they have an access to that, a, a limited access, but an access nonetheless. And so they can plant a thought in you, no problem. And you, you can think that it's your own, and it, and it really isn't. Um, and this is, we've all experienced this with temptation, right? Like we, you experience a temptation and, and you're like, wow, I mean, this, you know, even when you recognize, ah, this is a temptation, but at a certain point, if you don't act against it, you, you just, you give up and you can, you can give into the temptation, whatever it, whatever it is, you know, you, you, you think, you know, gosh, I'm just not going to talk badly about that person. And then all of a sudden, two minutes later, you're talking badly about the person simply because you, you haven't steeled yourself enough against the temptation and the devil is persistent. Now there are some of you who say that if we show real footage of exorcisms, there might be those who will be more inclined to believe, especially for the skeptics. But, well, there are real footage of exorcisms out there available on YouTube, even those performed by the late Father Gabriel Morth, but still those who won't believe will not believe. But anyway, here's some audio clips of real exorcism. And if there are any of you who might speak and understand Italian, would you be so kind to help translate what is being said in the audio clip? As for this audio clip, I've placed the source of the audio in the description box below. Oh Madonna, oggi è la festa tua del Santo Rosario. A me piacerebbe che questo Belzebù no? ci facesse un po' di catechesi sul Santo Rosario. Allora ti chiedo, Madonna, eh, ne ha già dette oggi di cose e di catechesi, ma oggi è una festa particolare. Ti chiedo se per un po' di minuti o per tanti minuti lui sia obbligato da te a parlare del Santo Rosario. E dunque, con il permesso di Maria, per ordine del cielo, io ti ordino di parlarci del Santo Rosario e della, tu, della sua potenza contro di te. Nel nome di Dio ti ordino di parlare. Parla bene in un bel italiano e dici cose belle e tante cose. Parla. In italiano bello. Quella corona mi distrugge. Parla meglio, un bel italiano. Sei capace. Avanti. Ogni ave Maria mi scoppia il cervello. Avanti, continua senza che debba dirtelo in continuazione. La Madonna vuole. Continua senza che debba dirtelo in continuazione. La Madonna vuole che tu ci dica la potenza del Santo Rosario contro di te. È una preghiera semplice 
che non tutti fanno ma chi la fa si unisce alla vita di Cristo e di Maria e a me mi scoppia il cervello sentire quella cantilena non lo sopporto e anche chi lo tiene in mano senza pregare mi dà fastidio, non lo sopporto, ma lei ama questa preghiera. Avanti. E chi lo prega in famiglia ha una protezione particolare da lei. Io non posso entrare in quella casa. Non mi è stato dato il permesso. Perché la potenza del Santo Rosario in famiglia mi schiaccia. Avanti. E in quelle fa una sola persona che lo prega può salvare le altre della famiglia. Oh Maria, ti ringrazio che costringi questo demone Belzebù a fare questa pubblicità, questa catechesi sul rosario. Oh Maria, è preziosissima. Io col tuo permesso vorrei condividerla con tanta gente. Fallo parlare. Avanti. I misteri che lei predilige sono quelli della passione di Cristo perché lì c'è tutta la salvezza dell'umanità e quelli gloriosi no anche avanti Ma chi recita il rosario io arrivo a disturbarlo. Come? Con pensieri, distrazioni. Ma la Madonna gradisce ugualmente? Sì. Avanti. Bisognerebbe farlo con i bambini, imparare loro questa preghiera prima che arrivi io a disturbare. Perché io poi gli rubo la purezza e le novene mi fanno scoppiare il cervello. Non le sopporto. Soprattutto Maria che scioglie i nodi. Guarda, a noi piacciono tanto le litanie e mentre le dicevamo prima sentivo che tu le pativi. Cosa ci dici delle litanie? Mi schiacciano. Mi danno fastidio! 
Perché? Perché è un continuo lodare, lodare, lodare. Ma lei lo merita? Per voi. Ah, per veramente anche la tua regina, anche se tu non la riconosci. O no? Già. Hai ancora, lei ti dice di dirci ancora qualcosa o hai finito? Rispondi. Ho finito. Allora noi preghiamo Maria. Salve Regina, Madre di Misericordia, vita, dolcezza, speranza nostra, salve. A te ricorriamo, esuli figli di Eva, a te sospendiamo gementi e piangenti in questa valle di lacrime, or su dunque, avvocata nostra, rivolgi a noi gli occhi tuoi misericordiosi e mostraci dopo questo esilio Gesù il frutto benedetto del tuo seno, o clemente, o pia, o dolce Vergine Maria. Noi ti ringraziamo, io tuo sacerdote esorcista milanese, ti ringrazio di questo dono che ci hai fatto, a gloria tua, e così sia. Amen. We do appreciate any donation to help out with getting better images and stock videos for use of visual aids in our future videos, so there won't be any risk of copyright strike. If you are willing to donate, and any amount will be much appreciated, there's a link to the PayPal donation down in the description box below as well. Before I go on any further with this video, I would also like to add another question that Father Vincent Lampert always receive, which is regarding the Nephilim. That's always a question that comes up, whether it's the angels came down and had relations with women and then a race of giants came about. A lot of the discussion goes on here because that's also a reference to some other accounts that have to do with angels and demons from other sources that are not part of the sacred canon of the Bible. So one can read like the book of Enoch, for example, that would reference this and this causes some confusion. But the most important thing in this discussion, according to Father Lampert, would be that demons will always try to tempt people to rebel against our relationship with God, and in doing so, they lead us into sin. And now, I would like to share with you what Father Lampert said about the hierarchy of demons, which is pretty evident during exorcisms. According to a lot of exorcists that I've listened to, the highest ranking demon during exorcisms will always be the last one to leave, and here's why. From a Catholic perspective, we talk about the the hierarchy of the angels. Mm -hmm. So there are nine choirs of angels. When one third of the angels fell, they fell from all nine choirs. So there is also a hierarchy within the demonic world. And I think most exorcists will tell you that when somebody is possessed, it's not a case of just one demon, but multiple demons. Even listening to Bible stories about Jesus casting out demons, they go from speaking in the singular to the plural back and forth. You know, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come against us before the, the appointed time? So there's always a cluster of demons. Demons don't have any love for one another. They despise each other just as much as they despise us, mm -hmm. but they are united in their hatred for humanity. Mm -hmm. So they are in a cluster when somebody is possessed, and there's always a demon of a higher rank. And then that demon of a higher rank, it's also my experience, is the last one to be cast out mm. those that are weakest they will quickly submit to the power and the authority of christ his name and they will go those that are of a higher nature will try to believe that somehow they have the greater power to resist for this part of the video there's something that i'd like to bring your attention to exorcisms are not exclusive to the catholic church father vincent lampert said as much can a baptist or an Anglican perform exorcisms, definitely. But listen to what Father Martins has to say about it and why sometimes these Protestants exorcists will have to bring over difficult cases of exorcisms to the Catholic Church. They don't only respond to Catholic priests, that, that absolutely. Um, so the, the power, the Christian power comes by virtue of one's baptism. And, and the Lord said, in my name, you will cast out demons. But at the same time, there is a, a, a universal understanding uh, among the Christian, uh, among the Christian peoples of of the world, that.
that Catholicism has a success. When I say Catholicism, I also mean orthodoxy, right? The, the, the branches of Christianity that, ha that have and that share the ancient priesthood instituted by Christ, that those have a power and jurisdiction over the demons that no one else has. So we see this in our ministry. I, I, I see it in mine, where uh, Christian denominations bring cases that are extraordinarily difficult, where the demon of the whole, uh, the hold of the demon, is not able to be broken by prayers that have been uttered by, by their congregational community, uh, and so they're bringing them to the church for its ministry. For the next part of this video, it's something we shared in the past, but I guess it's important to bring up again. During one exorcism session, Father Martin said that one of the demons told him that his name was Zeus. Exorcists certainly do encounter demons that are higher in authority than others, and generally, the first demons that show themselves in a possession are the lowest level, lowest ranking foot soldiers of the devil, and they'll be the ones being thrown out to take the initial punishment. And according to Father Martin's, only when they have cast these lower ranking demons, then they would move on to other layers, and in some exorcism cases, there are multiple, multiple layers, and these exorcists are peeling those back before they can get to the one possessing spirit, the one that holds the rights. And as an exorcist, this is what they're aiming for. They're making their way towards that demon that holds the right. And one of the demons, his name was Zeus. So, uh, was it the Zeus of Greek mythology? I, I don't know. Uh, if I were to ask the demon that, he might say yes. Uh, but, you know, that kind of question, the demon doesn't have to answer that. And, 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 and any answer he gives, I can't rely on it to be an honest answer. The only honesty I can compel or any exorcist can compel out of a demon is, relates to the circumstances of, of this particular case, of this victim that you're inhabiting. I can compel an honesty with regard to what is going to get him out. But insofar as, as his own biography and his own history, um, he can give any answer he wants, and I can't compel an honesty there because it doesn't relate to the pastoral situation uh, at hand. It doesn't relate to exorcism. We're entering into a different realm. So I never ask questions like that. Uh, it, it, it would be dangerous to start believing information given information that is unnecessary and gratuitous from the, the Prince of Lies. One of my favorites that was said by Father Martins during an interview is when he described what happened to the victim at the moment of a liberation. According to him, the liberated victim would sometimes see the Blessed Mother, sometimes they see a saint or even Jesus, but there were also times when they don't see anything. But what the exorcist will most definitely see is an immediate difference in the eyes of the liberated victims. They will see the person, and according to Father Martins, that's the best way he can describe it. Throughout an exorcism, the exorcists are looking into the eyes of the victim. They're looking at something that is inhabiting the possessed victim, that has a definite personality, and when that personality leaves, it's unmistakable. They can see that the eyes are the window into the soul, and at the point of liberation, they are seeing the individual now. They're seeing the person. Oftentimes, what Father Martins would see is that there's a brightness coming from the person, almost like a glow coming from their flesh, that the light of Jesus is now in them and it hasn't been in them for a long time. If you are still here watching this video after listening to these exorcists and still do not believe in the supernatural realm, still do not believe in the existence of God, still thinking that the devil is just a necessary tool made up by the church to make them listen to what the church is saying, this is what Father Martins has to say to them, and please do, for your own sake, listen closely to what he's saying. If you don't believe in God, if he's not a reality for you, ask him to make him that reality. Because if he does exist, he is quite capable of making himself known to you. So uh, stop, stop searching for evidence of him and ask him. Or, I mean, you don't have to stop searching for evidence, but, but, but more than that, make a dialogue with him, your focus, because that is what is going to be much more effective at giving you what you desire and what you were created to have. Father Martins also cleared up some confusions about exorcism. Most people think that exorcism is a kind of one-time, one-shot thing, but the reality is it's not. 
According to him, most possession cases require on average 75 exorcisms, and they require an exorcism done once a week for about a year and a half. But there will be some that are much longer than that while some are relatively quick. For the ones that last a while that last a long time, those are the ones that typically have multiple possessing spirits, and the initial ones are always the lowest on the totem pole. They're the lowest because that's how the main demons, and especially the main possessor, saves his energy and protects himself from being cast out. The other way that one knows is just the sheer strength of that demon relative to the others. Let's listen to Father Martins himself then. Uh, and typically when you have a main possessor, it isn't even the fact that uh, the initial demon uh, is, is who the main possessor is but there's an exchange of rights in the demonic kingdom. So maybe it may have been a lower level demon that obtains access to the person. Those rights are given to a, a, a big guy. And that big guy, just his sheer power, his resistance, um, his character and nature is much more difficult to deal with than a lower level one. Often, often, they will be mute spirits, like you hear about in the scriptures, where they don't talk. Nothing I can compel them uh, to, will, will, nothing I can level at them will make them talk, because in their nature, they're not speakers. Uh, just like in their nature, most demons I encounter, uh, when the possession happens, their eyes roll into the back of their head. So for the next two hours, three hours, four hours, the entire time of, of the exorcism, I just have two white eyes, with no pupils at all staring at me. And yet the individual will know exactly what is in the room. And with an uncanny accuracy, the demon can reach out if his arm is free and grab somebody by the throat and start, and start squeezing. If we reach the point in knowing the devil for who he truly is, he's nothing to fear, especially if our relationship with Jesus is where it needs to be. That's why I love listening to Father Lampert whenever he speaks about the saints of the church, such as Padre Pio. A saint of the church, uh, St. Padre Pio, he used to call the devil Old Bluebeard, and uh, he believed that he was afflicted, not because of anything that he had done wrong, but God permitted him to be afflicted by evil as an opportunity for him to show his fidelity to God. Think of Job out of the Old Testament, same category, St. Paul as well talked about the thorn in the flesh that he received, a messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. So the church would say in the lives of the saints, many of them were afflicted by evil. Padre Pio called the devil old bluebeard. He said one night he was trying to sleep. He heard all this noise in his room. He turned over and looked and said, oh, it's only you old bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he rolled over and went back to sleep. Now, how many of us would have that mindset if we believe the devil was actually in our rooms? Most of us would be terrified. After listening to a lot of these exorcists, here's one thing I can share with you, and that is, the exorcists cannot perform an exorcism on somebody against their will because as humans, we have free will. Someone can make the choice for Jesus, or they can make the choice against Jesus. What we can do instead on our part, we can certainly pray for that person, praying that they come to a better understanding of why it's important to have a relationship with Jesus. That's why it's important to remember that if there's no willingness for the demon to be gone, then it cannot be cast out. I talked with an elderly man one time at the request of his family because uh, they said he has no faith and we're concerned that when he dies, what will happen to his soul? And as I was talking with him, the man told me that he had befriended demons throughout his life but when he died, he had no desire to be with God. He actually wanted to spend eternity, he told me, with the devil and the demons that he had befriended in this life. Now, I hear that and I think, wow, that's crazy talk. But again, that's the choice that he's making with his own free will. Certainly, I would pray for him that he would have a change of heart and a conversion and welcome Christ into his life. But again, you think of scripture, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't kick the door in and say, here I am to save the day. We have to invite him in. He desires that we have that relationship with him, but we have to, to want it. He doesn't force it upon us. There are a lot of comments in this channel where non-Catholics are saying about the pedophilia cases within the church and that the church isn't addressing the issue often enough. Well, contrary to what these people are saying, 
A lot of Catholics are talking about it. Let there be no doubt about it. And here's Father Lampert talking about it. So for those who are saying these exorcists aren't talking about it, here's the proof for all to see. I would say that the abuse that, go ahead, that is going on in the church is certainly uh, horrific. There's certainly no excuse for it. There's no place in the church for anyone who's involved in the abuse of children or anyone. And I think that, you know, I would say as horrific as this is, this could be an opportunity for the church to even purify itself. You know, every time the devil does something that he believes is advancing his kingdom, maybe trying to destroy the church from within by these priests who have been abusing children, you know, the church can take ownership of her own sinfulness and use this as an opportunity to cleanse the church. And in doing so, you know, perhaps advance the kingdom of God even further. You know, I believe that abuse is perhaps more prevalent in our society than we realize. And the church, rather than trying to cover up her sins, needs to own up to them and set the example for society in general on uh, how we need to repent. Because I think the danger is that people look at the sins of the church and they want to discount the message of the church. But even though certain messengers may be flawed, the message of the church can never be flawed because it's a message that comes from God himself. And so the church needs to deal with her sinfulness so that people don't begin discounting the gospel. You know, you look at faith today that's in decline in the lives of so many people. And I think the church also has to look in the mirror and say, how have we contributed to this loss of faith in society by our own sinfulness? And certainly child abuse is at the very top of that list. And I saw several comments in some of the videos of people wondering what happened to the demons after successful exorcisms, after they are successfully cast out. Well, just because a demon is cast out of somebody doesn't mean that somehow they're destroyed at that moment. When the angels fell, we know God permits them to roam the earth until the end of time. And so when an exorcism occurs, it's just that the connection between that person and that particular demon or demons is broken. But it does not mean that those demons have been destroyed. Let's remember that God has not left us vulnerable because he's given us his son, Jesus. He's not left us vulnerable. He's given us the remedy to defeat the devil. But again, like the angels, when they were created and were given free will, the human person has free will as well. So God wants us to freely choose him. He doesn't force himself upon us. God has given us exactly what we need to defeat the devil. But again, if people are not strong in their faith, 1 Peter says, be sober be vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeks one whom he may devour. Resist him. Be solid in your faith. A lot of people today were not solid in our faith. And so that's giving the devil the upper hand. So we are not vulnerable if we're solid in our faith and living out our commitment to Christ. And again, if we fall short, we repent. We own, we own up to that. We take something that's perceived as a weakness and we turn it into a strength. St. Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. So we take something the devil is trying to do, and we use it against him by using it as an avenue to draw closer to God and have a more solid relationship with him. So I would say that God has not left us vulnerable. He's given us the tools. He's given us Christ, but we have to make the choice for Christ. I'm sure some of you have heard of people that have dreams about demons. I've even made a few videos covering about this very subject before. What the exorcist monstigner Stephen Rossetti said about it. Well, I guess it's a good idea to hear what Father Lampert has to say about it as well. You know, for one to have a dream about a demon, I guess I would ask the question, what's, what's going on in their life? You know, is there some internal struggle? Mm. Is there some type of faith crisis? Because again, if demons are trying to intrude into one's dreams, then there has to be something else going on in their life. But again, trying to understand that and balancing it with one's relationship with God is so important. But again, I would say the person identifies himself as a Christian. So the devil obviously believes that this occurrence is going to rattle the person somewhat. And again, use it against him. Don't be rattled by this experience, but use this experience to draw even closer to God. I was going to say the devil plays on a person's memory and imagination. So there's something going on, I would say, in the person's life that the devil believes is a weak link 
in the mm. chink of their spiritual armor. So he's trying to get a foothold in the person's life. But what about sleep paralysis? What should we do about it if somehow we're experiencing sleep paralysis? I would say that a lot of people that I've talked to that have had sleep paralysis have that sense of the presence of some demonic entity. Now, I think in the, the medical world, they may come up with different explanations, but I've had people that would say sleep, sleep paralysis came about, you know, maybe they kind of woke up, there was a presence of a demon in their room, and they were just paralyzed. There was no way that they could even move, and there was a sense of just being really, really terrified. You know, when people experience that, the best thing to do is to pray. You call upon the Holy Spirit, because wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. So I always tell people, if, if somehow you believe there's some type of demonic presence around you, just invoke the Holy Spirit. And you know, if a person really hasn't done anything wrong to bring about a presence of evil, then God just may be permitting it to happen as an opportunity for the person to show their fidelity to God. And I call that demonic oppression. Oppression is a gift from God. That might sound kind of strange, that God would allow us to be afflicted by evil. But again, God can permit that as an opportunity for us to show our fidelity to God. Because it's easy to be a person of faith if everything is going along great. But, you know, if we're going through pain and suffering, you know, then perhaps there might be the temptation to abandon our relationship with God. We were talking earlier about suffering, you know, and sleep paralysis can be a form of suffering. I was thinking of Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. I think any time that we feel like we're being afflicted by evil, we haven't done anything to bring that on. We just have to remember that Christ is with us. He's at our side during this time of darkness. And if we call upon him, then he'll come and evil will flee. There's always people that say seeing is believing, but from someone with faith, the perspective is the other way around. Believing is seeing. So I think we're coming from two different viewpoints. If somebody has the position of faith, they believe in these types of things. People that perhaps say seeing is believing, maybe coming from more of a scientific background will kind of doubt that. But I would say that people's doubting of God and of the spiritual world doesn't make it any less real or relevant. And again, one of the main basis for what we believe comes from the Bible itself, which we believe is the word of God. So it's the narrative that we follow. There's a lot of people today that follow all kinds of different narratives. We hear that in society today, where's the science in that? Or today people discuss the constitutionality of something, and there's always different kind of viewpoints one way or the other. But if one's going to be a Christian, the narrative that we're going to follow is the word of God. And within the word of God, it speaks of the reality of things that are seen and unseen, visible and invisible, certainly of the spirit world. For the last part of the video, I'd like to share what the exorcists are saying about our blessed mother because her role in spiritual warfare is huge. For non-Catholics, especially the Protestants, when they hear Catholics speak this way of the Virgin Mary, they're assuming we're calling to worship her, which is far from the truth. But I guess that's another subject for a whole other video. For now, let me share with you what exorcists are saying about the Blessed Mother. According to exorcists, here are some of the testaments that demons were forced to confess about the Virgin Mary during various major rites of exorcism. Mary is the terror of hell. She sovereignly loves mortal beings. Her love for mortals is inconceivable. She snatches away from us demons more souls than all the angels and of all the saints put together. I compare Mary to a formidable army. He who loves Mary is a friend of God. God is pleased with Mary. He gives evidence of that by never refusing one grace of all those that she asks of him. When a person prays to Mary, he does not do so with enough respect. One does not recognize that honoring Mary honors God who made her as she is. At other times, in a disdainful tone, a demon manifested again his refusal to accept that the Virgin Mary was put over him through these expressions. She is only flesh. I am pure spirit. No, she is not. She higher than me. No, I am spirit. On another occasion, responding with words already used in part before, a demon affirmed, I rejected that she would be next to him. I could not bear that a human creature would be above me, because I was the most beautiful angel, beautiful, 
beautiful, the greatest. I was Lucifer, the angel par excellence. The woman, for love of his children, she was created before all times in the thought of God. And as a pure spirit, I cannot bear this, that putrid flesh. She is feared by us because she holds you in her arms with her humility, obedience, and merciful love. The purity of her body, it was not ever touched, not even by a thought. We did not succeed, not even with a thought. I did not undermine her even with a thought. Not one, not one. Cursed. I was never able to touch her because that one always watched over her. There was always that one. It is not my fault. I was not able to touch her. I was afraid. Another time, with evident metaphoric language, the demon not having either skin or brain because of the nature of its immaterial spirit, a demon said, Every time that she descends onto the earth, we sink even lower. Every one of her tears is a hole in our skin. Every one of her glances is a tearing of our brain. Every one of her steps is our end. We are looking to stop her, but we do not succeed because she is more powerful than us. Evil has no power over her. One time, the demon expressed the continual gratitude of Mary to God as follows. She always sings the praises of that one, as she did before, but very few on earth are able to hear when she sings. The demon probably was referring here to our incapacity to understand fully the greatness of that heart that praises God for the benefit of her children. Well, that's all for this very long video. I'm truly sorry I took so much of your time by watching this video, but it's my sincerous hope that you've learned a lot from this. If any of you are interested to watch the full length of any interview shared here in this video, I've provided the links in the description box down below. And also, we're also just sharing this with you, if you don't mind just a bit more of your time. We do appreciate any donation to help out with getting better images and stock videos for use of visual aids in our future videos, so there won't be any risk of copyright strike. If you are willing to donate, and any amount will be much appreciated, there's a link to the PayPal donation down in the description box below as well. And again, finally, thanks so much for taking the time to watch, and until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless all of you.